A little louder. Good morning would be good. It's so good to be in the presence of God, to worship Him, to um, give our best to Him. So thank you for choosing to give to God um, today. Um, one of the things that you know, we, we are working on as a church is um, to make use of our time best uh, and to give more opportunity for us to be able to receive the word. Um, and so this morning we're going to continue our series called Win the Day. Um, we began the series last week. Just in case those of you who missed me last Sunday, welcome back. You should tell me welcome back, so, but I'm still telling you the welcome back. Um, good to see you uh, this week after, after a long time. I came back after a long time. All right, so we started this series with the simple thought um, that almost anyone can accomplish anything um, if they work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. There's nothing that is impossible for us to achieve in our lives. That was the thought that which, with which we started last week. We talked about how yesterday is, a, yesterday is history and tomorrow is a mystery. And therefore, our, our one job is to win today, win the day. In, um, Ingmar Bergman, a Swedish um, a movie director, um, he, he's an Academy Award winning uh, film director. He said something like this, that, if, do you know what filmmaking is? And he, he, as he's talking about, um, you know, in an interview about filmmaking, movie making, he says, eight hours of hard work each day just to get three minutes of film. If I work eight hours, I can only get three minutes of film um, a shot. In other words, what he's saying is this, it takes hard work for us to achieve something that is of quality. If we want to win something in our lives, win our today, we must then work hard, long enough, smart enough, and hard enough. Uh, um, in, um, uh, and hard enough. Um, somebody once said like this, if the success is the byproduct of a well-managed failure, and I think it is, um, then the strength is the result of well-managed weakness. All we are trying to do is if we want, as we are trying to win the day, is to manage our weakness well. So that, you know, uh, on a daily basis, we'll make improvements and then ultimately our strength, uh, our weakness itself becomes our strength. That's the goal of this series, to help you to understand that it's okay that we are not perfect. It's okay that if we are, uh, we are with flaws, we can still win the day that God has given to us. Last week, we talked about how in order to win the day, um, uh, we have to develop certain habits that will help us to stress less and win more. And the first habit that we talked about is, um, um, is what we call the flip the script. It, if, you, if you want to change your life, you have to change your story. You have to change the way you tell your story. You have to change the way you look at your life and what's happening in your life. The difference between success and failure is the stories we tell ourselves. True or false, the stories that we tell ourselves become self-fulfilling prophecies. If you tell yourself the wrong story, you'll live a lie. If you want to change your life, then you have to start by changing your story. And the only way to do that is to look at your life through the eyes of God. Like Joseph did, we talked about how we all need to develop a 50-20 vision. You remember last week I talked about how we all need to develop a 50-20 vision. Genesis chapter 50 verses 20 is the verse that we took. And how Joseph looked at his life uh, where, and narrated his story saying that you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. That's how we look at our lives. What stories are you telling yourself? Um, and uh, where do they come from? Um, are they helping you or hurting you? Think about this. Are they accurate or inaccurate? Are they carefully crafted or, or off the cuff? Uh, who is narrating your story? You, your parents, your friends, your doubters, your haters? 
or have you given the editorial control of your life to the one person who needs to have that control that is Jesus Christ that's the whole point of this uh, of this series that we want to help you to offer your life story into the hands of God i want to tell us uh, i want to uh, i want for us to read a story and then we will dive into the word of god Bef- but before we do that i want to take a moment to worship god offer ourselves to him and declare his um, victory over our lives um as uh, w- w- before we read the scripture you know we have um the devotional ready for you um it just has it, it has nothing else but just for you to write down your your notes each week's notes and also gives you an opportunity for you to um you know do your own personal devotion or when you're meeting together as a plug in you have something to discuss about each week's uh, message all right so if you want this we we are not just giving away for everybody we, if you want this and if you're serious about i want to follow this series and i want to write down please lift up your hands they'll get you one of those books and also a pen that if you need a pen they'll get you a pen do it fast i want to see a victory okay so as they're giving would you like to stand to your feet take your bibles um and turn with me to J- john chapter 21 here is how jesus flips the story and here is how he helps us to do the next thing that we're going to talk about um kiss the wave and i want to set this um use this passage as as the, uh, my primary source for of a source for the thought for today um and i want to give you an opportunity to worship him all right um genesis uh, sorry jo- john chapter 21 verses 1 to 19 open your bibles and follow along with me i don't know if it's on screen but just follow along with me as i'm reading Later Jesus appeared again to disciples beside the sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas nicknamed the twin, Nathanael from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, "I'm going fishing." "We'll come too," they all said. So they went in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At the dawn Jesus was standing on the beach but the disciples couldn't see who he was he called out fellows have you caught any fish no they replied then he said throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you'll get some so they did and they couldn't haul the net because there were so many fish in it then the disciples disciple who loved Jesus said to Peter it's the lord When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord he put on his tunic for he had stripped for work jumped into the water and headed to shore others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore for they were only about 100 yards from the shore when they got there they found breakfast waiting for them fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread bring some fish you have just caught jesus said so simon peter went abroad uh, went abroad uh, aboard and dragged the net to the shore there were 153 large fish and yet the net hadn't torn now come and have some breakfast jesus said none of the disciples dared to ask him who are you they knew it was the lord then the lord served the bread and the fish this was the third time jesus appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead after the breakfast jesus asked simon peter simon son of jonah uh, do you love uh, son of john do you love me more than these yes lord peter said you know i love you then feed my lambs jesus told him jesus repeated the question simon son of john do you love me yes lord peter said you know i love you then take care of my sheep jesus said a third time he asked him Simon son of Jonah do you love me Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time he said lord you know everything you know that i love you 
Jesus said, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went, uh, and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. If you really read this story, you'll really see how Jesus flipped the script of a person. It doesn't matter where, uh, what state you are in today, what condition your life is at this point of time. And you may feel like you're experiencing defeat. But Jesus is going to turn it. You're going to see victory in your life. Believe that. Our goal is to help you to see victory in every area of your life. Emotionally, physically, spiritually, professionally, financially, uh, in every area of your life. Believe that. You see, the thing is this, that you have to believe it before you receive it. That's why every time people came to Jesus with a need, he asked them, do you believe that I can do this for you? And when they, when they said they believe, that's when they received their miracle. So I'm just asking you, join along with the worship team as we begin to declare, I'm going to see a victory in my life. In those areas of my life that I feel like I'm hitting a wall, I'm going to see a breakthrough. I'm going to see door, doors open. I'm going to see healing in my body, healing in my relationships. Can you do that? As you close your eyes, lift your hands up. Join our worship team as we begin to sing. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory in my head. Thank you, Jesus. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good and you turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good and you turn it for good You take what the enemy that God this morning we declare that each one of us we will see a victory in our lives we will see a breakthrough in those areas of our lives that are uh, that seem like impregnable God we know that you're going to create uh, cracks in those walls and you're going to create doors through those walls God we thank you for doing that we believe it by faith 
We pray that, God, as you begin to change us, as you begin to transform our mindsets, God, I pray that we would begin to see how you care for each detail of our lives. Just as you did with Peter, God. We see what you did with Peter in this, in this incident, God, in this narrative. We, we see how you restored his life. He was defeated, he was a failure, he gave up. And yet you chased after him, changed his life. Not just him, God, and everyone who followed him. I thank you, God, for the way that you transformed. Flip the story, God, completely. And God, you helped him to begin to experience breakthroughs in his own life. And I pray that this morning, each one of us, we come here, humbly bow down, offer ourselves to you our hearts to you, our families to you, our troubles to you, would you please begin to help us to win the day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together. Praise our God as you sit down. Please be seated. They say, if there is one thing that I've learned um, through the scriptures and through as you know, as uh, in, our, in my own personal journey in life, is that everything in our past is a preparation for something in the future. Everything that we experience, everything that we go through in our past, is something um, that, you know is a preparation for something in our future. God, I realize, doesn't waste days, even bad days. He doesn't waste our days. He doesn't waste even the days that we messed up. He, in fact, uses them. To turn it something for good in the future. So believe that. And that's what's happened in this story. And as we trace through the scriptures, we begin to see that's what God's been doing, not only through the scriptures, but all through the human history. On October 19th, uh, 1856, Charles Spurgeon, who's called the Prince of Preachers, was preaching to a, to a congregation of 10,000 people in... Um, um, in a London Surrey Gardens Music Hall. It's a concert hall. It was uh, packed to the brim to the, uh, by people. While uh, he was about to begin to preach, someone yelled in the, from, the, uh, of, you know, from the audience, fire. And the moment they heard the word fire, a pure, it, it was pure pandemonium after that. People began to run. Uh, the, the whole, you know, the whole uh, auditorium began to be um, began to move in uh, with the way that people were trying to exit the building. That in fact it it created um, uh, you know such kind of um, um, a stampede that a balcony broke through. A balcony broke down and fell down. Nearly 33 people died on that day while the service was happening because of the pandemic uh, pandemonium. Um, at the end of that commotion, um, um, 28 people were seriously injured. Seven actually died on the spot and then the rest of them died uh, while they were recovering from their injuries. On that day, it's interesting that Charles Spurgeon was going to speak from Proverbs chapter 3 verses 33. And it says like this, the curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked. That's a strange title to preach and strange thing to happen on that day. He was preaching that. He would never preach that message again. Never preach from that passage again. At the end of the tragedy, um, uh, at the time of the tragedy, Charles Spurgeon was only 22 years old. 22 years old. He was reaching his prime. Uh, he was in his prime. He was reaching his fame as a preacher. You can imagine 10,000 people congregating together to listen to a 22-year-old means he's actually making it in his life. He just got married 10 months ago. He just got married, had, had, uh, um, just had babies, twin babies. Um, so uh, not just a new, new husband, a new father, and that to two kids. And one kid itself is a big deal. Two kids, imagine the kind of pressure that gets to add on to him and the pressure of being famous preacher by then already at the age of 22 in front of a 10,000 congregation where everything went haywire. In fact, he was just then appointed to be the newly installed pastor of a church called Metropolitan Tabernacle. It's still there in London, by the way. It was uh, for last, um, you know, it was at one point um, a world's largest church. While Charles Virgin was pastoring it, it in fact was the world's largest church. Um, can you imagine the kind of stress 
Charles Spurgeon would have felt on that day and the aftermath of it. The newspapers wouldn't leave him alone. Days together, they were publishing about how um, I know this um, um, uh, um, this meeting caused the death of people, and and uh, every day reading that in newspapers would add more stress to him. It marked him for life, Charles Spurgeon. This prince of preachers, in fact, almost gave up preaching after that, gave up pastoring after that. He couldn't handle it. But here is the beauty. Few people advance the kingdom of God quite like Charles Spurgeon. Along, uh, along with pastoring the largest church in the world at that point of time, he wrote 150 books, uh, started a Bible college, and led more than 66 charities. Makes me wonder how did, did he even have spare time you know, to do all that. Despite all his successes and Thousands and hun uh, I know, uh, 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 you know, hundreds of millions of people who were uh, affected by his preaching. Despite many of his successes, Spurgeon was marked by melancholy after that. He, it took that, that incident took measure on him. It, 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 um, it became a thorn in his flesh. It, it was a burden that he couldn't carry. He had to carry, but he couldn't carry all his life, he just struggled with continuous bouts of depression, deep depression. This is the world famous preacher I'm talking about. This is the preacher who affected all of us, you know, for centuries together, hundreds of years, decades together. All of us uh, have learned something from him. I still go through a lot of messages, um, a lot of his messages, Charles Spurgeon's messages. Learn a lot of deep truths. And yet he is one person who struggled with many bouts of deep depression. Because he just couldn't shake off what happened on that day. 25 years later, in the same Surrey uh, Music Hall, he was invited to speak uh, in a Baptist convention, World Baptist Convention. And he had to stand up on the same pulpit that to, you know, 25 years ago he preached from. And as he was about to preach, he remembered that incident. He just couldn't continue to preach anymore. By then, he was already a world-renowned preacher. Just couldn't continue because he, every, he, as he stood there, he could, he could continue to imagine what, what had taken place 25 years ago, just as he was about to preach. That's how deep our memories can go. Our past experiences go in. You see, our ability to remember our past is a gift from God. But it comes with a caveat. That we don't always remember things accurately and we remember things selectively and those selective memories are deeply hurting many times. When we remember the yesterday wrong way, we live a lie. And living a lie undermines our ability to win the day. It was, this, it was Persian who said, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Now only he can say something like that. And that's why our title came from that statement, kiss the wave. What he's trying to in effect saying is this, that when waves throw me, and if they throw me at the rock of ages, I might as well kiss the wave because that's when I learn to depend on the rock of ages. Do you know the rock of ages? Jesus Christ is the rock of ages. That every wave that is throwing at us, he's been thrown at us, every wave that is throwing us, if it is throwing us against the rock of ages, we might as well kiss the wave. That's what we all need to learn, to kiss the wave. That at this point of time may scare us, may frighten us, almost make us feel as if we are drowning, give us that sense of uh, death, you know, almost a smell of death. But if that wave is throwing you against the rock of ages, you might as well kiss the wave. We need to learn that. That's an art. See, you may not be responsible for the difficulties you have had to endure, but you are responsible. You'll be able to respond well. 
It's incredibly counterintuitive, I know. But obstacles that we encounter are not the enemy at all in our lives. In fact, the enemy, more often or not, is us. The obstacle, the obstacle, believe it or not, is the way. That's the main idea of this sermon this morning. The obstacle that you are facing today is not your enemy. In fact, the obstacle is the way that God is going to use you if you learn to kiss the way. See, we all face obstacles throughout our lives. And many of us allow those obstacles in whatever form they are to overtake us. They can be memories, they can be sin, they can be failures. We allow them. They can be words by people, uttered by people. We allow them to overtake us. However, if we use those obstacles, those bad things, those bad things that have happened to us, to our advantage, they can become a leverage rather than a downfall. That's the idea of kissing the way. So what does it mean to kiss the way? I want to explain that in three simple statements today. We're using multiple stories from the scripture um, in order to you know, drive, you, uh, drive home this point. We'll come to John chapter 21 towards the end because it makes more sense then as we unfold this whole thought. What does it mean to kiss the wave? Number one, kissing the wave is confessing what's wrong in our life. Kissing the wave is about confessing what's wrong in our life. You see, you got to own your past or the past will own you. How? You have to accurately inventory your past, hiding nothing from God, from yourself, and then you have to own it all, the good, the bad, the ugly. I'm not asking you to go around and talk to people and talk about your past. That's not what I'm asking you to do. But you do need to take a stock of all your past. And then confess it in the presence of God. Own it. Because that's the only way to deal with that. Otherwise, your past would begin to own you. Whatever it is, the good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, or whatever it was, you have to accept it. Owning our past involves three things. Number one, owning our past involves facing our fears. That's number one, facing our fears. The things that are keeping you in bondage. There are things that are keeping you in bondage. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we did an entire series from chapter 19 of 1 Kings last year. So I'm not going to dwell too much on that, but just want to recount the story for you. 1 Kings chapter 19 is a very interesting uh, sto- narrative of how this prophet, just like how Charles Spurgeon uh, was world famous, this prophet at that point of time was, uh, even now, is the greatest prophet ever lived on the earth apart from Christ. Elijah was running away from a woman called Jezebel simply because she uh, warned him that she's going to kill him. And as he's running away, he gave up on his life, became physically, mentally, uh, uh, spiritually exhausted, asking God to take his own life, take his life. And that's when God worked in his life, restored him, restored his physical strength, restored him spiritually. And then God tells him something that kind of caught my attention In chapter 19, verses 15, he tells him the first command that God gives Elijah after he recuperated, saying, Elijah, I want you to go back. That's the one thing Elijah was trying to avoid. It's not the past that he wants to go back to. It's not not something that he wants to face. Jezebel is not somebody he wants to face. In fact, that's why he was running away from Jezebel. But God tells him, I want you to go back the same way you came. In other words, God is telling him, go back and face Jezebel. Go back to the same place that you're running away from. It's unless you go back there, you cannot face your past, face your fears. It is unless you go back to that place, you will not be able to move on to the next level. That's why God challenged him to go back, face your fears. You're worried about Jezebel, you shouldn't be. Jezebel is not least of your problems at all. It is unless you go back and face her, you'd not realize she's nothing. She's 
what you thought was the biggest enemy is not even an enemy at all for you. It is unless you turn back and face your fears, your past will start owning you, your fears will start owning you. They'll keep you in bondage. So you need to face your fears. That's how you own your past. You need to confess your sin. That's how you need to own your past. You need to confess your sin. See, the things that are keeping you in guilt. Now, I, I'm, I'm under no illusions that any one of us is a saint here. All of us are sinners. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Bible clearly states that. And I'm glad that all of us have accepted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. I'm hoping that you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And you have asked him to forgive of your sins. But that doesn't mean we, from the day we have confessed our sins, we remain saint. We are not. We struggle with sin every day. Because the sinful nature is within us. Of course, the Spirit of God who lives inside us gives us power to overcome that sin. But then you have this constant fight between your old nature and the new spirit who's leading us. We, we sometimes buckle, you know, bow to the old nature and sin. In verb, in, uh, whether it is a verbal sin, whether it is a thought level sin, whether it is an action level sin, whether it is an attitude level sin, I, it doesn't matter. We all sin. The thing about Christians is this. The thing about those who know God is that the moment we sin, we know we sinned. And we know that it is not a good thing. We know that it affects our spiritual life. We know that it, is, it has a spiral effect of affecting everybody else too. And we live in that guilt. One of the reasons why Peter wanted to give up what he was called to do and go back to what he used to be doing was because I'm sure he was carrying a lot of guilt on him. He knew Jesus was banking on him to be the rock. He knew Jesus uh, had high expectations from Peter and Peter failed Jesus. And the burden of failing Jesus, denying Jesus in this, uh, uh, right in front of Jesus' eyes, it takes a lot of toll on us. When your sin is public, you feel even more guilty. And you just can't shake that guilt off. People can't just... So the struggle is real. But then the only way to get rid of that is to confess your sins that, keep, that are keeping you in guilt. That's the only way to own it. Confessing is acknowledging that I did mess up. Confessing is acknowledging and taking responsibility for your mess. And saying, yes, I did. And I know I did. I'm ready to face the consequences for it. In order to own your past, you need to face your fears. You need to confess your sin. And you need to accept your vulnerability. There are things that you cannot do. You need to understand that part. There are circumstances and conditions that are out of your control. If cancer hits your body, there's nothing you can do about it. Doctors may have certain level of knowledge and there is nothing more beyond that they can do. There are times that we feel utterly helpless. There are circumstances that we feel utterly helpless. Like how the disciples found themselves caught in a storm. In Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, you see an incident when Jesus, uh, along with his disciples, were crossing the Galilean Sea uh, in the boat. Jesus was sleeping in the boat, and uh, the boat got, got, got caught in the middle of a storm. It was a frightening sight. Now, these are many of them among the disciples were expert fishermen. That simply means they know how to navigate through a sea. They also know how to navigate through difficult uh, you know, circumstances in the middle of a sea. And yet, even they were scared for their life. That's how violent the storm was. That's how violent the waves were. The wind was added to the waves. It was even more frightening. They got so scared, they thought they're going to, the, the, the boat is going to be capsized. And they, they thought they were going to, they're surely going to die. And then in their panic, even the expert boatsmen, fear, caught, gripped them so much. In their panic, they woke up Jesus and said, Master, Master, 
What are you doing? Jesus gets up, calms the storm by saying, peace be still. Then, as the winds and the wave calm down, there's an expression by disciples. They wondered at how the winds and waves are also obeying him. No wonder Charles Spurgeon taught us to kiss the wave that hits us against the rock of ages because only the rock of ages can calm the wave that is throwing against our lives. You do need to accept your vulnerability. It is only by accepting it, saying that, listen, I, I got no control over my life. I'm helpless here. The things that make you feel helpless, the things that keep you helpless. At that point of time, any phys physical uh, in infirmity or, 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 or a weakness that you're struggling with or a circumstance that you have no control over, you might as well give it up into the hands of God. Because winds and waves would listen to the rock of ages. That's how you own your past. But here is the point. Before God sent Elijah on his way back, he first revealed himself to Elijah. Elijah saw who God really was. Realizing that God is bigger than Jezebel. God is bigger than his fears. God is bigger than his failures. God is bigger than his, his situation. He feels helpless. He, pe he feels powerless. But he sees God and then realizes God is more powerful than my situation and my crisis. You see, kissing the wave is about confessing what's wrong in our life, but it's also professing what's right with our God. That's the point. Yes, I know, when you keep confessing what's wrong in your life, it may actually make you more depressed rather than feeling good. But here is the point. You cannot simply confess what's wrong with your life. You also need to profess what's right with your God. You see, the thing about being a Christian, being a person who knows Jesus Christ, the, 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 the honor and the joy of knowing Christ personally is that, that we know who our God is. We know what he, can, he is capable of doing. He can calm the winds and waves. Every circumstance, from greatest of joys to the deepest of sorrows, is an opportunity to discover a new dimension of God's character. The circumstances you are asking God to change in your life may be the very circumstances he may be using to change you. You see, I've realized this. Sometimes God delivers us from suffering. But sometimes he delivers us through it. I'm not asking you to derive pleasure from your pain. It would be masochism. Not sanctification, definitely. Kissing the wave is simply acknowledging that it is what it is. You have to own what happened without letting it own your emotions. Kissing the wave is not some kind of obsessive, compulsive, passive, aggressive kind of mindset. Kissing the wave is like this serenity prayer offered by Reinhold Niebuhr. We, we, all, we all know the prayer. Many of us know the prayer. May not know who penned it. Uh, here, is what it, it here is how it goes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Courage to change the things that I can. And wisdom to know the difference. That's a beautiful prayer to pray. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. And that's what I'm asking you to do right now. But courage to change the things that I can, and that needs to be done. We'll talk about it in the next point. And wisdom to know the difference. So there are things that you can change. You do need to have the courage to change them. And there are things that you just cannot change. You might as well accept them. But the poem doesn't end there. It's got a little more. And I think we need to listen to that too. He goes on to say, living one day at a time 
enjoying one moment at a time. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, courage, courage, for to, the th courage to change the things that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. That's a full prayer. Relying on God's grace is no easier than relying on God, uh, relying on God for daily bread. Last week we talked about give us this day our daily bread. Relying on God's grace is even more tougher, you know that? Because we just can't accept God's grace. It's too good to be true. We feel like we are unworthy to receive that kind of grace. We feel like, not me, I, I, I don't know how to handle this. We want to be, the problem with us is we want to be self-sufficient. In fact, we confuse self-sufficiency with spiritual maturity. Our only sufficiency is the grace of God. And the only way we qualify for it is that we don't. Mark Batterson goes on to say, His grace has the power to bury the dead yesterday six feet deep. The problem, of course, is that we keep digging them back up. God's grace buries our past six feet deep. Problem with us is we keep digging them back. They say Martin Luther would spend six hours at a time in confession. Six hours? If I sit down for prayer, it will take hardly six seconds for me to say, God, forgive me. Six hours? What would he be? Is Martin Luther more sinful than me? I doubt it. What did he have to confess so much? Maybe Martin Luther knew something about the power of confession that eludes most of us. Lord, forgive me for everything I've ever done wrong. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. I'm definitely sure and I have no doubt that God can answer that prayer. God, forgive me for everything that I've done wrong. But, in, but, but, but I think it's, it's, it's kind of weak. The feeling of being forgiven will probably last as long as you prayed that prayer. Six seconds. Our confessions of sin need to be as well defined as our professions of faith. Listen, uh, this is what Mark Batterson says. If faith is being sure of what we hope for, then repentance is being sure of what we are sorry for. Does that make sense? If it helps, you know, we all need to try uh, writing down our confessions, you know, when you do that. The less we confess, the less we feel forgiven. The less forgiven we feel. The more we confess, the more forgiven we feel. It is true. Confession is good for the soul. Whatever you don't confess, you repress. Remember this. Whatever you don't confess, you repress. And whatever you repress eventually resurfaces in a ways that are unhealthy and unholy and often at the most inappropriate times. So if you want to see forgiveness sink in a little more deeper, Try confessing a little longer. That doesn't mean you beat up, beat up yourself for six hours. But I kind of feel that if you can give more room for the Holy Spirit, a longer time for the Holy Spirit, He will get into those deeper places of your life that are shut off for everybody else. They say the standard counseling session would last about 55 minutes. If you give I'm sure if you give that kind of time to the ultimate counselor, he will teach you how to kiss the wave. So kissing the wave is not just confessing what's wrong with your life. Kissing the wave is professing what's right with God. Number two. Kissing the wave is to grieve for what is lost. Kissing the wave is to grieve for what is lost. So in the process of accepting 
what happened to us, many of us repress our grief at what we have lost. I'm sure it's our mistakes that led us to lose a lot of things in life. But because we hold ourselves responsible, which we should anyway, for the mistakes that we have committed, which led to those losses, we kind of convince ourselves not to grieve over what our loss is. And we repress that, that, that grief inside us. So whether you lost something because of the mistake that you have committed, or because of somebody else's mistake, you do need to take time out to grieve. It is that times of grief that helped Charles Spurgeon to get back up and start walking again. I want to tell you this. That's the truth for every single minister of God. Everywhere in the world. If a minister of God is trying to serve God faithfully, he will go through those experiences. Every single one of them will go through bouts of depression. Now, I, you might feel it's a kind of generalized statement, but it is true. It's very rare to find people who are extremely optimistic who are preachers. I want to tell you, most of the ministers who stand on the pulpit and preach to you struggle with bouts of depression and deep depression. They may not confess it to you. I'm very open about it. Not everybody may be open about it on the pulpit. But, but doesn't mean they stay there. That every time they go through those bouts of difficult seasons, depression, God speaks to them, restores them. Allows them to grieve over their loss. Charles Spurgeon, during one of those bouts of depression, he penned this, and I kind of feel that's exactly how I felt many times in my life. My spirit was sunken so low that I could weep by the hour like a child, and yet I know not what I wept for. That's how depression feels, right? You're crying like a child, you just don't know why you're crying. Grief is depression in proportion to the circumstance. Dr. Andrew Solomon says this, um, a psychologist says, grief is a depression in proportion to circumstance. Grief is a good thing, it's a God thing. God is the one who created us with tear ducts, right? But emotions like grief can be inflated or deflated just like our memories. Last week I talked about memories. That's when we endanger ourselves with our own emotions. He continues that thought. Dr. Solomon continues that thought and he says, depression on the other hand is grief out of proportion to the circumstances. So you do need to grieve. You can't, ju you can't just pass by the past. Just because I told you to confess your past and accept your past, I know it's not easy. And I have, I am, I am not saying I can understand you. And I cannot. Your experience is your experience. My experience is my experience. All of us have different ways of dealing with that. We do need to deal with that. though. And one of the ways to do that is to grieve over our loss. But that's not the end of kissing wave. Kissing the wave is to grieve for what is lost, but it is also being grateful for what is learned out of our loss. Does it make sense now? Yes, of course, I want you to grieve. But you can't stay in grief. You'll go into depression. See, the only way to come out of that depression and grief is to be grateful for what is learned. We have seen God turn some of our toughest tests into our most treasured testimonies. We wouldn't want to live those seasons all over again. None of, no, not me and Janet, definitely. And I'm sure none of you want to go through those tough seasons of your life. While you are grateful for God to turning those tough seasons into testimonies, none of us want to live those seasons all over again. But we wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. All those experiences have taught us something in life. 
See, every testimony starts with a test. You pass the test, you get a testimony. And testimony is the way you overcome your next obstacle. Charles Dickens, almost, you know, is a contemporary of Charles Spurgeon. Charles Dickens wrote this wonderful book called uh, The Tale of Two Cities. The whole book begins by this way. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. More than just an epic opening, it's true, you know. It's a truthful take on life. The thing is this, we want the best of times without the worst. We want wisdom without foolishness. We want light without darkness. We want hope without despair. That isn't reality, is it? The best of times and the worst of times often occur at the same time. It's, you know, it's, life is a two-sided coin. In the words of John Piper, don't waste your cancer. If you understand what I mean. You can fill the blank with whatever challenge you are facing today. Don't waste it. Maybe it has come to teach you a lesson that could not be learnt in any other way. Kissing the wave starts with this brave question. What have you come to teach me? John chapter 5 has one of the most remarkable miracles that you would ever see in the scripture. I loved, I don't know how many times I preached from there because it just keeps speaking to my life all the time. It involves a man who has not taken a single step for 38 years, lying down in his makeshift world, 8 by 8 mat world. 38 years is a long time to live on that world, that small little world, unable to move, nobody to help him. When you see a person like that, you'll, your heart will sink, you know, you would want to do something for them and you would use the kindest of words to speak to a person like that. But Jesus seems like he asked him one of the most cold-blooded questions that he can ask a person like in that, that kind of state. You feel like it, it's a heartless question to ask that guy. It was the question, do you want to get well? Of course I want to get well. That's why I'm here for 38 years. But think about it. If you are lying down there uh, um, on that mat and Jesus comes to you and asks you that question, you feel, what's wrong with you, man? Do you want to get well? Well, it seems a little insulting, but not so fast, you know. I know people, and you, I know you do too, who don't want to get well. They would rather die than change. And maybe some of you are like that. You would rather die than change. Listen, if you don't want to get well, even Jesus can't heal you. That's the truth. That's true even if the pain that put you there was not even your fault. If you're going to flip the script, listen. The pain of staying the same has to be greater than the pain of change. It, you, know, you, you just have to feel that pain inside your heart that I can't be like this anymore. And I know changing is difficulty, but I'm, I might as well do that than endure this kind of pain. That's why Jesus had to ask him that question. Do you want to be healed? Do you really want to get healed? You got used to 38 years of life here on this mat. But do you really want to get healed? Many times we undermine our own healing instead of participating in it. God can deliver in a day. Remember last week I talked about how God can make decades happen in a single day. God can make decades happen in a single day. But you got to, you got to back up the deliverance with, with, with you know, daily winning the day to fortify your newfound freedom. 
If you don't, it will be short-lived. You'll end up right back where you started or even worse. Now, the strange thing is I preached it so many times, this message, and I still missed out verses 14. That this guy goes into, into the temple. Everybody's asking the question, how are you walking? And he says, somebody healed me. I don't know who healed me. Um, then finally, Jesus meets him in the temple, talks to him, and then he says, listen, stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. Wait a second, how did I miss this? It's a reality, it's not a threat, by the way, it's a reality check. When Jesus healed that man, he who hadn't walked for 38 years, healing came with a warning. Stop sinning. Worse may happen to you. Now I know it's hard to let go of our present tense concerns and future tense anxieties, but nothing is harder than letting go of our past tense pain. We own it so that it won't own us. We take full responsibility for everything in our lives and we learn to grieve and then move on. What have you come to teach me? Number three, kissing away is saying goodbye to unhealthy reflexes. Kissing healthy, uh, kissing away is saying goodbye is to say goodbye to unhealthy reflexes. Now it may sound a little complicated, but let me explain this. We all have what we call coping mechanisms. It's what psychology calls coping mechanisms. We all learn to cope with our situations in certain ways. We develop certain habits. We develop certain reflexes. We condition our body, condition our mind in order to deal with our body blows and experiences. We react that way. They're called conditional reflexes. Like uh, a Russian, psycho it, it, it was first coined by um, a, a Russian psychologist called Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, who performed a groundbreaking um, experiment with, you know, salivating dogs. Uh, he won a Nobel Prize for that. Dogs naturally salivate when they are presented with food. But Pavlov wanted to see if that salivation could be caused by any other stimulus. Now, as you may remember from your high school science class, and many of you are smarter right now, and so you know what I'm about to share, he, Pavlo conditioned a dog by sounding a buzzer before feeding it. Eventually, that buzzer, even without the presence of food, at the sound of that buzzer, the dog would naturally salivate. He called this, this learned experience, um, um, a response, as conditioned reflex. Now we all have that. Over the course of our lifetime, we accumulate an elaborate uh, repertoire of, of um, um, uh, conditional reflexes. Some of them could be a minor idiosyncrasy, and like a nervous laugh or <laughs> something like that, in order to cover our nervousness. Others can become major personality traits, uh, like sarcasm. And I know sarcasm is a big, major, conditional reflection, reflex. Many of us develop that. Some conditioned reflexes are as natural and as normal as a blush. But others are destructive, like cutting and binging. And One thing is certain, we are, we are far more conditioned than what we think, what we realize. Now I understand traumatic experiences can lead us to a place like that. Traumatic experiences can hold any person a hostage. And the ransom is the rest of their life, his or her life. The story of... Uh, Miss Havisham is, 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 a, is a story that we all need to remember. Written by Charles Dickens in the book called Great Expectations. 
of this woman, the, you know, how she's left at the altar on her wedding day, um, which turned actually into a nightmare. A wealthy spinster she was. She loved Compensé, who never showed up. He feigned, in fact, his love to defraud her. And the story goes on, and I, I obviously I don't want to get into the story, but I just want to paint the picture of uh, Miss Havisham, how she was humiliated, heartbroken, she had a melt, mental breakdown, you know. Uh, from that day, she, re she never took off her white wedding gown. She remained, the, all through the story, uh, she remains with the wedding gown. It, the offense broke her heart so much that she remembered the exact time that this happened at 8.40, in the morning. And so Miss Havisham, uh, for her, time stood quite literally from that moment. That she, you know, she got stuck in that moment so much that all the clocks in her home, she, she puts it at 8.40 exactly and just left it like that. For the rest of her life, she lived in past tense. Past tense pain. She may be correct twice a day, but she lived in her past tense. I wish uh, Miss Havisham was nothing more than a figment of imagination of Charles Dickens, but we all know, we all have some Miss Havisham inside us. If not us, we know a Miss Havisham who died Living, but died. Stopped living. That's what I mean. A traumatic experience can definitely hold us um, as, um, as a hostage and keep us ransom, as ransom, you know. We do need to overcome them. We do need to say goodbye to those conditional, unhealthy conditional reflexes. There are quite a few epic failures in the scripture. But nothing is more rehearsed than Peter's denial of Jesus. Like Jesus even gave him a warning. Today, this very night, before the rooster crows, crows you will deny me three times. Could Jesus have been more specific, more accurate than that? You know, he was, he's telling the time, he's telling the action. And he told, who's going to do that? To the person who's doing it. Who was going to do it. Yet Peter denied Jesus. Three times. As the third time uh, he was denying Jesus, the rooster crowed. Now, remember Ivan Pavlo I talked about. Ivan Pavlo. Here's the Pavlovian thought. You know, as you think about Peter. I wonder if Peter ever felt, well, actually, always felt a twinge of guilt every time he heard a rooster crow. Have, you know, have you ever noticed that stimuli that could trigger old memories to you? Like every time I see a tomato papanum, it triggers old memories to me. Doesn't matter who cooks the tomato papu. For some of you who are unlearned, papu is lentil soup, just in case. And it's really tasty. Uh, every time I look at, you know, tomato papu charu, I always remember my grandmother. Just evokes my memories of her. And the time that uh, she would be cooking that papu charu on a, on a makeshift stove with, you know, with this pipe into, into uh, you know, Uh, those memories don't go away. Now, I kind of feel that every time he hears the sound of a rooster, Peter would remember how he denied Jesus. That's conditional reflex. Conditioned reflex. Every morning, I'm sure he was rudely awakened by the reminder of, a reminder that reminds him of his epic failure. That's the way enemy works, you see. 
He's the accuser of the brethren, isn't he? He wants uh, us to constantly remind ourselves of everything we have done wrong. He doesn't just prowl around like a roaring lion. I think he crows like a rooster too. But here is the beauty. A few days after Peter's denial, Peter informed his brothers, his friends, I'm going out to fish. That's what we just read in chapter 20, 21. Now the thing, look at this. His reflex, instant reflex on the decision is this. I can't live with this memory anymore. I want to change the scenario. I want to go back to my old profession. Now his decision did not only affect him. That's the point I want to make this morning with you. Our unhealthy reflexes not only affect our lives, but affect even good people too. So when Peter says, I want to go look at, now let's go to John chapter 21. That's where we started. That's where we'll end anyway. John chapter 21. Several of the disciples were there. Simon Peter, Thomas, the, you know, the one who's nicknamed as twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, sons of Jabadi and the other disciples. Peter said, I'm going to fish. We'll come too, they all said. Now if Simon says, I want to go, it's okay if Andrew says, I will come with you. It's even okay if James and John says, we'll come with you. Because they're fishermen by profession. Thomas says, I want to go with you. I can understand Thomas is a doubter. Well, really, that's a bad name to give him, but. But Nathaniel, not Nathaniel. Nathaniel, last week I told you Nathaniel was too perfect. Even, you know, for schooling, he was a good guy. Even Nathaniel got affected by that. And he says, I'll go with you too. That's how we will affect others if we have unhealthy conditioned reflexes. Not only he went back to his old way of life, he affected everybody else to go back to their old way of life and a way of life that is not the call of God. And actually, I think we tend to make more mistakes then. We throw in the towel. That's how mistakes become losing streaks. We flip the script wrong way. But the good news, the good news is Jesus can recondition our reflexes. That's why this story is very, very important for us to read. The next morning, Jesus shows up at the shoreline. Peter and uh, his crew couldn't catch anything all night. Then they heard someone say, try the other side, try the right side. Now the other side of the boat is only seven feet, you know, away. It's just that, that's shallow it is. Uh, nobody catches fish there. <laughs> but then they did what Jesus asked them to do. Even though he, they didn't know who it was at that point of time. Here is what Jesus is doing. Disciples flipped the sides. Jesus flipped the sides again. And they caught so many fish. Peter immediately knew this is not a Monday morning fisherman. This is Jesus. Now I love the guy, the way he jumped into the water. He did not, you know, he actually put on his clothes. He was in workman's clothes. Now he put back his regular clothes because he now know no more fishing. Jumped into the water, came all the way to Jesus. Kissing the wave is kissing goodbye to unhealthy reflexes. But it is also a loving Christ. To recondition your reflexes. It's much easier. I realize this. It's much easier for us to act like a Christian. Than to react like one. I'll let that sink in. It's much easier for us to act like a Christian. Than to react like one. Because maybe that's why Jesus so focused so much. So much more. I, in his teaching on reconditioning our reflexes. 
pray for those who persecute you. When somebody persecute you, that's not the reflection. It's counterintuitive. Jesus is saying, don't do what your intuition says. Do the counter. Pray for those who persecute you. Matthew chapter 5 verse 24. Luke chapter 6 verse 27. The same thought in another place. Love your enemies. That doesn't go. Bless those who curse you. Mm, doesn't work again. With us, that's not how we react. Anyone who forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Matthew chapter 5 verses 41. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other cheek also. Matthew chapter 5 verse 39. None of these things come naturally to us. They're counterintuitive as the kissing the way. That's all Jesus is trying to do with us. He's reconditioning our reflexes. So here is my closing thoughts. As, um, oh, no, I shouldn't open, close this. Because this is very important right now. Um, as Jesus began to change his life, there are a few things that we all need to learn. Number one, we all need to maintain a Deuteronomy 29, 29 file. Last week, I told you to maintain a gratitude file. You remember that? Write down everything you're thankful for. Today, I'm asking you to maintain a Deuteronomy 29, 29 file. Let's call it 29, 29 file. 29, 29 file is filled with things that you don't understand. Like why? Somebody died. Why they died at the age they died? Like why? You know, certain things are taken away from you. Things that you don't understand here on this side of the eternity. Write them down. Because they don't make sense. And those are the questions that you will not get answered on this side of the earth. The reason I said Deuteronomy 29, 29 is go back and read that verse. Uh, and it, it talks about how there are some mysteries that are reserved for God. Not for us to understand. And so there are questions on this side of our life that we'll never be able to answer. Write those things down because, you know, I know you can't get an answer. You just need to accept that. Um... Number two, release your scar. Release the scar. You see, when you, when something happens, when your, you know, tissues breaks because of, uh, you know, I'm just talking about a physical tissue. Once they do an operation, they tell you, the physiotherapy involves you to massaging and releasing the task, that, that, that scar tissue, that joint, the things, right? If you don't do that, you're more prone more for more injuries. And in our language, releasing the scar is to offer forgiveness. That's our language. Release that scar. If you don't offer forgiveness to a person who hurt you, you will be the one who is struggling all your life. Not the guy who hurt you, but you. Because you're letting the scar stay. The scar tissue to remain like that without actually working on it. Uh, number three, remember your sufficiency is Christ in Christ alone. See, the secret to intimacy with another person, Craig Bond says, is discovering the sufficiency of God, God's love without that person. It takes a little more time for you to understand this. The secret to intimacy with another person is to discover the sufficiency of God's love without that person. Now the point is this. If you understand that God loves you sufficiently, you'll be able to freely love others. Even if they don't love you back. That's the point. That's, that's why I'm asking you to remember your sufficiency in Christ alone. His love sets us, to, sets us free to be who we are meant to be. When you know that you're loved by God, you don't have to play God. And the people you love don't have to bear the impossible burden either to love you back. 
That's when I realized that it's easy to love people and let them go. When I understand this truth, that I'm, for me, Christ's love is sufficient. For me to understand that God loves me and loves me sufficiently, once I understood that, then it became easier for me to love people back again, trust people back again. Because even if they leave, it doesn't work, it doesn't affect my life anymore because I find my love and my sufficiency in Christ. That's what Jesus was teaching this guy, Peter. After they heard, they, they, they hauled the miraculous catch of the fish to the shore, Jesus made the disciples breakfast on the beach. I don't know how we got the fish before they got it. Um, then he asked Peter the pointed question, right? Three times, do you love me? Do you love me? The third time, Bible actually mentions Peter was hurt. Peter grieved. This is no, no coincidence. It's genius, yeah? It's like a full circle movement for, for Peter. It's, is it possible that Jesus knew something about reconditioned reflexes long before Ivan Pavlov knew? That Peter denied Jesus three times. What did Jesus do? He restored Peter not once, not twice, but thrice. See the, how, how Jesus is reconnecting the dots? Then sometimes, you, you know, you, you have to say something hurtful to someone to help them. Now, please don't take my word and abuse it. Okay? Many of us speak truth in love, but our agenda is different. Um, not because you have something to get off your chest. Don't, don't do that. Uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to be, to show tough love, but just, that's what Jesus is doing with Peter, helping him. I, I don't know if you ever realized how the recommissioning took, when the recommissioning took. G, John's gospel is very explicit, right? When did Jesus meet these guys? At the dawn. When did the roosters crow? At the dawn. You see how Jesus is reconditioning all his reflexes? It's almost, looks like a coincidence, but it's not coincidence, it's providence. That is how Jesus is reconditioning Peter's reflexes. Now, he would never forget every time the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, crow, a rooster crow, Peter felt guilt. Now, every time rooster crows, Peter remembers the sufficiency of God's love. Remembers what God does for him. See the difference? With one act of grace, Peter, you know, flipped the script. With one act of grace, God flipped the script. With one, after, one act of grace, God gave a new chapter to Peter. And it, with one act of grace, God can give you a new chapter. If you just let him. His mercies, no wonder the Bible says his mercies are new every morning. May you experience that mercy. It's time to turn your page on your past. You see, if you don't do the first two, you will not make sense of the next five. That's why these two are very important. To flip your script and to kiss the way then you're ready to start winning the day. Would you close your eyes? Take this time to thank God for what he has done with Peter and how he flipped the script and gave him a new start. He's willing to do that with you today. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And we sang this song called Jaira during the worship. The song talks about how he's more than enough for us. Nothing else is more important than him. An all-sufficient God, more than enough for us. So that's all you need today, him. And if you understand the sufficiency of God's love, It'd be easy for you to kiss the way. Let God help you to kiss the way.
Thank you, Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to pray and deal with your past today. To learn to accept things that you cannot change. To choose to confess sins that you have not. To choose to face your fears. And you cannot do it on your own. I understand that. That's why you need to remember what's good. What's right with your God. He's all powerful. He can the, he's the one who can control the winds and waves. And so kiss the wave that throws you against the rock of ages. Choose to grieve today. If you need to cry, cry. Cry for your loss. It's okay, but let it go today. Let it go. Learn the lesson that you need to and move on to your new season. Whatever unhealthy reflexes that you have developed, coping mechanisms that you developed, allow Jesus to recondition them. So, may, so you may begin a new chapter today. Whoever you are, and if that's your prayer today, to help you to begin new, I'd like to pray with you and as we bring the service to an end. So I want to take this moment to pray with you. If you would like to stand to your feet, acknowledging that I need help. I need you to help me to deal with this. I need you to help me to kiss the wave. Would you like to stand to your feet? Our worship team is going to sing. Declare that he's enough, more than enough for us. Thank you, Jesus. Our child. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Is he just as revealing with beauty and splendor? How much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you? And if he watches over every sparrow, how much more does he love? more does he love you and if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor how much more will he clothe you how much more will he clothe you and if he watches over every sparrow how much more does he love you how much more does he love you? And if he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you? And if he watches over every sparrow, how much more? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? How much more does he love you? Think or imagine a calling to do his part, walking in the It's more than enough. It's more than enough. Think or imagine. enough God more than enough more than enough if you love
the sparrows. If you watch over sparrows, how much more would you love us, God? Help us to remember the sufficiency in your love. And that's where our security lies in God. I pray today for every one of us as we submit our lives. Help us to say goodbye to our past. Help us to say goodbye to our grief. Help us to embrace everything that is right with you. Help us to embrace every lesson that we have learned through our experiences. Help us to allow you to recondition our reflexes now, God. Thank you for today. And thank you for everyone who's joined us to worship you here in this place and online. I want to thank you, God. I pray that this word would make um, be meaningful to people who received it with joy. Just thank you for speaking to me, God. Thank you. Bless you, God, for today. And I want to thank you for all our children um, for what they have learned at Sunday School. I pray that uh, everything that they have learned would be imprinted upon their hearts. During this season, this summer season, I pray that you would protect them, keep them safe. And God, if they have to travel, I pray that you would grant them travel, travel mercies. All the families that may go to their hometowns and, and, and God, villages, I pray that you would grant them safe journeys, God. And I pray that they would enjoy their time with their families, extended families and friends, and they'd be back with us to enjoy um, serving you again together at this church. Thank you, God, for, for, for this season and this beginning of new season. I pray that, God, that those of us who are going to be here help us to continue to learn um, through your scripture, continue to be encouraged, continue to be built up so that we can win the day. Thank you for choosing to speak to us this season. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Would you like to stand to your feet as we close the service with the Lord's Prayer together? Um, uh, don't be confused about giving thing. Um, if you already you know, are a regular giver to the church um, and you're used to giving online, just go ahead and do that. We just want to avoid the UPI payments because they're, you know, they're giving us trouble. Um, so I think one of the things that Pastor Ashwant is trying to tell you is Try and give your offerings in the church in kind, physically. It's easier um, that way to avoid any difficulty with the UPA things. If you are already used to giving directly online, just, just go ahead and do that. All right? Just remember that. That's, I think that's what he's trying to say. Anyway, in the next couple of weeks, we, we are going to have a completely new account. And uh, we will give it to you so that um, we will avoid all these confusions anymore. And that would be easier for us. Hopefully, it'll, uh, it'll get done in the next 10 days. All right? Let's do the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the love of our Father and the grace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.